All right, everybody. Good evening. Good to see all of you. Uh, we're going to get started, and we'll see if some other folks trickle in, and that'll be fine. But we want to get going because we've got plenty of things to cover in Mark chapter 10 and Mark chapter 11. A lot of fun things uh, to talk about tonight. No, there will, be, there will be some fun ones, some tough ones as well. But as is our custom, let's start with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, uh, we are glad to be gathered together tonight. We are glad that we get to encounter you through your word. Um, we're, we're glad we get to wrestle a little bit with how to interpret all of these things for our own context. And, and God, we just ask that you would illuminate us as we do this, that your spirit would guide us and direct us. And that most of all, we would know your presence here in this place, that you are are gathering us together and you are helping us to see more clearly who you are and what it is you're up to in our lives and in the world around us. And so God, do all these things in our midst tonight. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 All right. So we have learned thus far from Mark that he is declaring the good news of Jesus, that Jesus is king, that Jesus is son of God, and that he is actually the embodiment of this good news. And most of what we have seen so far is Jesus traveling around doing his ministry, healing people, forgiving people, teaching people, exercising demons. We've seen some stories where he's provided food for mass amounts of people, and they are satisfied. And he's even affected the elements. All of these things helping to portray his identity as divine and human at the same time. We see increasing tensions with the religious leaders, in particular the Pharisees, although that's going to expand a little bit more tonight, as we will see. And Mark has been really adamant that the outsiders in their culture, in society, are the people who see. They're the ones who get it. They're the ones that understand who Jesus is more readily. And the insiders are blind. They are the ones who don't quite understand. And the disciples being the primary examples of this, along with the religious leaders. And then in the last class we had last week, uh, Jesus' identity is revealed uh, through a couple of predictions that Jesus has of his uh, upcoming death, um, but also through this very mysterious uh, encounter with God and with Moses and Elijah that we call the transfiguration. All of that happened last week. And they were ways in which Mark was helping us to see Jesus' true identity. Uh, So today, as we start with the world behind the text, I want to talk a little bit about some of the cultural conventions and mores and expectations that were present in the first century in which Mark is writing and in which Jesus is doing his ministry. First of all, a note about culture. All cultures have mores, in other words, expectations or things that we desire to be the case or value in one another and things that we find to be taboo, things that we should not do. Some of those things are outright sins, but not all of them. Um, Every culture is like this, and it's always been this way, and that is certainly true in the first century in Israel, Palestine. Uh, The culture of those days um, was really impacted by a few different things. First of all, for the Jewish folks, the Torah um, and and scriptures as a whole, what the Jewish people still call the Tanakh, which is all of the Old Testament. But the Torah, the first five books of the Bible in particular, really affected their uh, social mores, their, their understandings of culture and how to interact with other people. Um, along with the Torah, the, the rabbinical tradition, so the arguments and um, conversations that people were having uh, as they tried to interpret the Torah was also a big influence in their cultural mores and traditions of the time. 
At the same time, there were values that were shared by the Jewish people alongside of their Near Eastern neighbors. Things like hospitality, for example. It was generally practiced across all Near Eastern cultures at the time that you should welcome strangers into your home or into your town, that you should care for them and long for the best for them. That's just one example of um, a cultural tradition of that time. And then increasingly within the first century in this context, Roman culture is playing out in their midst, and, and that is impacting their cultural understandings and their mores and their traditions and their values. All of these things all together are all playing out behind the scenes of the Markan text that we are looking at. And in particular tonight, we're going to see ways in which Jesus is responding to and at times even pushing back against some of the cultural assumptions, the cultural expectations and ideas and values of the time. In particular, here's uh, six things that you should be looking for as we go through tonight's readings. Jesus is going to push back against... Uh, their understandings of marriage and divorce. He's going to push back against their understandings of children and their value. He's going to push against uh, people's understanding of what it means to be wealthy. He's going to push back against power, and he's going to highlight servitude. Um, he's going to um, display royalty and kingship in ways that buck their cultural understandings and he's going to respond to the religious establishment of the day um, in ways that would have been kind of shocking um, in the first century. Um, so as we go along, I'll, I'll illuminate a little bit more of what's happening in the cultural context of the time, but I just want to give you a preview of that as we get started. So we are in uh, Mark chapter 10 and Mark chapter 11 tonight, and we're going to start... Uh, with verses 1 through 12 in chapter 10. Um, and we'll pretty much go section by section the way that the NIV uh, delineates these sections tonight. We'll read through and then have a little bit of teaching on some of the things behind the scenes and some discussion and time for questions as well as we go along. So uh, first, Mark 10 verses 1 through 12. Jesus then left that place and went into the, regi the region of Judea and across the Jordan. Again, crowds of people came to him, and as was his custom, he taught them. Some Pharisees came and tested him by asking, Is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife? What did Moses command you? He replied. They said, Moses permitted a man to write a certificate of divorce and send her away. It was because your hearts were hard that Moses wrote you this law, Jesus replied. But at the beginning of creation, God made them male and female. For this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. So they are no longer two, but one flesh. Therefore, what God has joined together, let no one separate. When they were in the house again, the disciples asked Jesus about this. He answered, Anyone who divorces his wife and marries another woman commits adultery against her. And if she divorces her husband and marries another man, she commits adultery as well. All right, uh, so Jesus is going to kick things off tonight with a really fun teaching. <laughs> uh, yeah. Um, so, actually, I, I want to back all the way up to verse 1, because uh, there's something here I want you to see. Um, we are under the assumption, we don't know for sure, but we're under the assumption that he's somewhere in Galilee, probably in Capernaum, based on um, what we read in, in, previous, in previous readings in, in weeks prior to today. Uh, and so verse 1 actually describes the way that Jewish people typically would travel from Galilee to Judea. It, it 
specifically mentions that they cross the Jordan ri River. Um, I didn't pull my map up, but I should have. Um, can you recall on the map of Israel that I showed you a few weeks ago, up at the top of the map would have been Galilee, um, and then down toward the bottom is Judea, and that's where Jerusalem, Jericho is, Bethlehem. In the middle is a region called Samaria. Samaria is somewhat Jewish. Um, what I mean by that is they are kind of the, the remnants of the northern tribe of Israel who didn't stick closely with the Jewish traditions the way that folks in Judea did. Um, and, and even um, went so far as to say that in Samaria, where, that was the place where God's presence resided, not in Jerusalem at the temple. Um, most Jewish folks found Samaritans to be highly offensive, didn't want to have anything to do with them, so much so that if they had to travel between Judea and Galilee, they would cross the Jordan River and go into to the east, into um, Gentile territory, travel up Gentile territory around Samaria to go either to Galilee or vice versa, back down to Judea. And that's reflected in this as well. They did not travel straight down through Samaria. They crossed the Jordan, go through Jewish ter or Gentile territory, and then enter into Judea rather than actually walking through Samaria. While they're doing this, a bunch of crowds come to him, and as was his custom, he teaches. And then the Pharisees come along and test him. And this is not the first time that we've seen this. And each time this happens, the tensions rise between Jesus and these religious leaders. So they ask him about divorce. Now, in this day and age, um, divorce was actually assumed to be... Um, acceptable, that's maybe a bit strong to say that, but, but definitely the case that divorce happened on a regular basis. Um, there were some very few Jewish groups at this time who outright condemned divorce. Almost all of them said it was condoned at least. What they debated was what were the circumstances under which divorce was acceptable. And the, and the debate really circled around um, Deuteronomy 24. And in, in fact, I want to read Deuteronomy 24, 1 through 4 to you um, so that you have a greater sense of the context of this debate. Um, Deuteronomy 24 says, If a man marries a woman who becomes displeasing to him because he finds something indecent about her, and he writes her a certificate of divorce, gives it to her, and sends her from his house. And if after she leaves his house, she becomes the wife of another man, and her second husband dislikes her and writes her a certificate of divorce, gives it to her, uh, and sends her from his house, or if he dies, then her first husband, who divorced her, is not allowed to marry her again after she has been defiled." Um, so this passage uh, becomes the root of their debate about divorce. The question is, what is displeasing mean? What can the man send her away for? And the debate surrounded really two ideas. One was uh, that the man could find anything displeasing about her. It didn't matter what it was. If he found displeasure in her, he could send her away with a certificate of divorce and they would be divorced. The other side of the debate was um, if she committed adultery um, or if he committed adultery against her, then he could divorce her. Um, so the, the ideas were pretty much um, rooted in patriarchy. Certainly the man had all the power in these situations. However, the idea of the certificate of divorce was actually to protect the woman. Because the idea was that if a woman was remarrying or, or marrying another man, that, that she was causing that man to commit adultery. But by having a certificate of divorce, it allowed 
that marriage, the second one, to be legitimate, at least in the eyes of the Jewish culture at the time, so that the man was not committing adultery. Does that make sense? So it really revolves around uh, the, their patriarchal assumptions regarding marriage and divorce at the time. And so uh, Jesus, when he hears this question, he asks them to respond based on what Moses said. And so they say Moses permitted a, a divorce to happen as long as there's a certificate of divorce. So they're referencing this passage in Deuteronomy chapter 24. But then Jesus's reply is noteworthy because he is um, really outside of the Jewish tradition at this time. Like I said, everybody pretty much is accepting of divorce at this period of time. And he says that it's only because your hearts were hard. In other words, God gave you this as an exception to what he really wanted. What he really wants is for you to embrace what he talks about in the beginning, Genesis chapter 1, Genesis chapter 2, that God makes men and women and that he uh, calls the man to leave their, his father and mother and be united with his wife and that the two, in their understanding, the two become one flesh. They are not just two individuals. They are united together. By the way, that is a true Christian understanding of marriage as well, that in God's image bearing that he has given to humanity, it is fully realized in marriage and that those two become one flesh and so they should not be separated. Uh, this was pretty tough for those Jewish people to hear in that day and age. And in many ways in our own culture, it is tough for us to hear. So much so that the disciples need some clarification on this. And so they ask Jesus later about it, and he ups the ante. Anyone who divorces his wife and marries another woman commits adultery against her. That's striking, again, because in those days, they didn't care about the women and how they were treated. They, were, they cared about if there was uh, adultery committed against a man. And so Jesus is elevating the agency of the women. And in so, he also elevates their responsibility when he says, and if she divorces her husband and marries another man, then she commits adultery. So as much as she is elevated and seen with more value, more responsibility is given to her as well. She also can be held accountable for adultery that she commits. So all of that is, is playing out and, and uh, the background of Deuteronomy and the religious tradition of the day is informing how people are thinking about marriage and divorce. And Jesus is trying to call people back to what God really wants out of marriage and not so much about human traditions and concerns that got added on along the way. Uh, now, um, because I recognize that this is a sensitive and, and sometimes difficult topic for us, I, I actually want to, you know, usually I wait till the end to do the so what part, but I, I want to stop and do that right now with this particular section of scripture, because some of us in this room have experienced divorce, and anyone who has knows that it stinks that it's incredibly painful, that it, it's um, full of all sorts of feelings of hurt and um, can often make future relationships really messy. I, I, I think everyone generally knows that this is the case. Um, I want you to hear pastorally from me that there are certainly times that Divorce is not only um, condoned, but is probably the right thing to do in cases where abuse is happening in a relationship, where adultery happens and trust is broken beyond repair. God doesn't understand that. Um, and Jesus understands that. 
what Jesus is responding to here is this flippancy that people have with marriage and divorce. Does that make sense? It's that, that people are, especially men, like they can just trade out a wife whenever they want to. And that's totally unfair to the women, in particular because the women are reliant upon the relationship for the man for security and safety and well-being in this day and age. Um, that's not so much the case today. However, the case is still that God's desire for marriage is that it would be long-lasting until we die because it's a reflection of the way that God loves us and is faithful and committed to us in the way that he longs for us to be committed to him. Okay, So I, I want to um, stop and ask if there's any questions or any thoughts um, based on that, um, before we move on, Pat. According to the, um, <laughs> uh, it says that the, the men were divorcing their the wives just because they saw a, a more beautiful woman, and they would just throw the other one away and yep. take this new one. Yep. Or if they didn't cook everything just perfect, they right. would just throw them out. And, uh, take another one. Yeah. It, 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 it was so funny to read what they were actually doing. Yes. Because it was so stupid. Yes, right. Yeah, yeah. Because they treated women like property, not like people. And so Jesus is calling them back to male and female. God has created them in God's image and that in marriage they are united into one flesh. Yeah. So, um, yeah, again, back to the points of elevating the agency and the value of women in this period of time and, and alongside, um, and this is particularly true in Roman culture of the day, although it, it does seem to be the case that, that in Jewish culture there was some of this happening, there were women divorcing their husbands. Um, that was much more infrequent, but it did happen. And like I said, more in Roman culture than in Jewish. Um, and so Jesus is responding to that as well. The, the woman is also being held accountable if she commits adultery by marrying another man without what a, 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 I think a real true just reason for divorce would be. As I mentioned, things like abuse and um, adultery, sexual promiscuity within the relationship. Yeah. Any other questions, yeah. thoughts? So where was the thought that um, men were above women or whatever. Was that in creation? Is that where they came up with that? Or? Great question. Yeah, so it seems to be really kind of a misinterpretation of what happens in Genesis chapter 3. In Genesis 3, you have the story of the fall. The serpent tempts uh, Eve she eats of the fruit, gives it to Adam, and then there's this curse. In other words, it's this way that God describes how because of their sin, everything is broken. And, and there's a statement about how the men will be over the women, and the, the women will have trouble in childbirth and that sort of thing. That gets read later as, oh, the man is supposed to be over the woman, not as what, what should be read as it's because of our brokenness that this occurs. That's not how God really desires for it to be. God desires that we would see each other of equal value. And though we may have differences between the two sexes, we can appreciate those differences. And those differences are what actually makes possible uh, unity, within, uh, particularly within marriage. Um, so, yeah, it seems to be a misinterpretation of what's happening in Genesis 3 that then plays out in a, in a big way throughout the rest of the Old Testament text and within rabbinical writings and in other Near Eastern cultures, which are generally even more patriarchal than Jewish culture is. And so some of those influences are also at play. Yeah, great question, Russell. Anything else before we move on? Okay. So, then we get to verse 13 through 16. 
People were bringing little children to Jesus for him to place his hands on them, but the disciples rebuked them. When Jesus saw this, he was indignant. He said to them, Let the little children come to me, and do not hinder them, for the kingdom of God belongs to such as these. Truly I tell you, anyone who will not receive the kingdom of God like a little child will never enter it. And he took the children in his arms, placed his hands on them, and bless them. Um, so we have this really quick interaction. By the way, this seems to be happening in the exact same exchange that we just had. So Jesus is teaching on marriage and divorce, and people who are a part of the crowd then start bringing their little children to Jesus. So there's a sense of, of family being the, the topic of conversation at this particular point. So Jesus is asked to place his hands on them as a sign of blessing. Uh, by the way, this is the first time in Mark where Jesus says, asked to place hands on someone where he's not specifically healing them. But in this particular case, and the context mis makes this clear, that's a, a sign of blessing, not of healing. Then, but then we see uh, this almost striking image, I think, to us today. The disciples rebuke these families who are bringing their children. In other words, get away. This is Jesus, the great teacher. Jesus sees this and is indignant. He does not like this and responds by, let the little children come to me. Now, this is not the first time that we've had this idea come up. This is the second time that this has come up. And uh, I believe I mentioned last time that children were amongst the lowest of the social hierarchy at the time. Children were seen as having little value, um, probably for a variety of reasons. In, in a, an agrarian culture like in the first century, children don't have much value because they can't work yet. Um, they have more value when they can contribute something to the family uh, and to society at large. Um, so that, that's part of why probably children have less value. Um, another reason is that um, child death was just so rampant in that um, day and time that I, I think there was probably a sense of like, I don't know if this kid's going to make it, you know, so we probably don't want to get too attached <laughs> because they really, and seriously, you know, the, these children died a lot, very frequently in this day and time. Um, so uh, they had much more value. It, it, it seemed like they were going to have a longer life if they could make it to their bat mitzvah or bar mitzvah, age of 13 or so. And then they can start contributing to the family and that sort of thing and, and the welfare of the family as a whole. Um, and then, as I mentioned, Outside influences also impact uh, culture. Now, traditionally, Judaism should have respected and cared for children. However, we do know that at times outside cultures would influence them. And one of the common practices of some of the outside cultures of the Near Eastern peoples of the ancient world was child sacrifice. Um, so it's possible that some of the, obviously that practice wasn't happening within Judaism, but the ideas behind it may have been influencing Jewish peoples as well. So children were seen with very, very little value. And so for Jesus to embrace them is very countercultural in that day and age. In some ways, it would have made sense for the disciples to rebuke these families, given what we know of their context. But Jesus is saying, no, let them come to me. In fact, um, truly, I tell you, anyone who will not receive the kingdom of God like a little child will never enter it. Um, so yes, a, a, a huge swing, once again, from the cultural understandings of people typically within this day and age. And then uh, directly from the end of this teaching, Jesus starts traveling. And so we get to verses 17 through 31. So I have a question. Go ahead. So did the parents want their children to be blessed in effort to maybe give them help? 
Longevity? Or at least, yeah, so probably not so much because they were already sick, but the sense of yeah, hopefully they stay well. Yeah. Bless them so they stay well so that they live longer. Yes, yeah. probably so, yeah. correct. I meant not yeah, sick. right, yes, yeah, 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 yeah. Yes, exactly, yep, very good, yep. Um, okay, verse 17. As Jesus started on his way, a man ran up to him and fell on his knees before him. Good teacher, he asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Why do you call me good? Jesus answered. No one is good except God alone. Now, you know the commandments. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not give false testimony. You shall not defraud and honor your father and mother. Teacher, he declared, all these I have kept since I was a boy. Jesus looked at him and loved him. One thing you lack, he said, go sell everything you have and give it to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come and follow me. At this, the man's face fell. He went away sad because he had great wealth. Jesus looked around and said to his disciples, How hard it is for the rich to enter the kingdom of God. The disciples were amazed at his words. But Jesus said again, Children, how hard it is to enter the kingdom of God. It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for someone who is rich to enter the kingdom of God. The disciples were even more amazed and said to each other, Well, then who can be saved? Jesus looked at them and said, With man, this is impossible, but not with God. All things are possible with God. Then Peter spoke up, We have left everything to follow you. Truly I tell you, Jesus replied, No one who has left home or brothers or sisters or mother or father or children or fields for me and the gospel will fail to receive a hundred times as much in this present age. Homes, brothers, sisters, mothers, children, and fields, along with persecutions, and in the age to come, eternal life. But many who are first will be last, and the last first. All right, so immediately following this teaching that Jesus has regarding divorce and then children, he starts on his way um, more toward Jerusalem, and along the way, a man runs, runs up to him, falls on his knees, and says, What must I do, good teacher, to inherit eternal life? Uh, it's kind of funny uh, that Jesus doesn't respond to the thrust of the request. The thrust is about eternal life and what must I do to inherit it. Uh, first, he takes issue with being called good teacher. Um, and it seems to be that this is a little bit tongue-in-cheek, right? That that he recognizes that there is no one good except for God. Oh yeah, that's me. Does that make sense? Um, so <laughs> it's a further way that, that Jesus, in this particular case, is the one saying it, Mark portraying it to us, is trying to convey that once again, Jesus' identity is being displayed as divine. Um, he is good, and there is no one good except God. And So, in other words, he is God. And then he gets to the, the real root of the question, and he starts by recalling what's called the second table of the Ten Commandments. Did you catch that? That all six of those statements were the last six of the Ten Commandments, with one kind of exception. Um, when it says defraud, that was a way that peoples in the, in the first century at that time uh, kind of um, substituted for coveting. Um, because the idea was if you're defrauding someone, then at root is the, the desire to have something that is not yours, which is coveting. Um, so defrauding was a way of putting it into real life practice what the Ten Commandments were saying, specifically the second table. And the second table refers to all of the commands in the Ten Commandments that are about human relationships. The first four are really about our relationship with God. 
And then after that, it shifts to how we interact and engage with one another. So Jesus is recalling all of these ways in which this man is supposed to be living out in his human relationships, the, those six commands from the end of the Decalogue. And so the guy says, teacher, I, I've kept all of these since I was a boy. And Jesus looks at him and loves him. So the sense in which he's like, yeah, but there is one thing you lack. Go sell everything you have and give it to the poor, and then you will have treasure in heaven. Now, it's, it's somewhat fascinating that uh, Jesus says that. Uh, frankly, it's ironic um, because, as we come to find out in the next uh, verse, this man was very wealthy. And, and so Jesus uses this phrase, one thing you lack, when in reality, he doesn't really lack anything. He's got plenty. He's got everything, at least from their cultural understanding of what everything was. He, he is provided for, taken care of. He, he has no things that he wants or needs other than inheriting eternal life. Now, when we hear that phrase, inherit eternal life, today, typically what we think of is go to heaven when I die, right? When you hear that phrase, you probably think, oh, because I'm a follower of Jesus, I inherit eternal life. That means I go to heaven when I die. When this man asks this question, that's close to, but not exactly the way that he would have been thinking about this question. First, he would have been thinking about inheritance. And, and typical way of thinking about inheritance is, I'm going to get some stuff after the old man passes away. Right? So, more possessions, more estates, more property going to come to me. Um, so, it seems as though the common understanding in the first century Jewish world of this time was that um, at the end of all time, that, that God was going to judge all of those who had lived and died and those who were good, especially good Jewish people who had followed the Ten Commandments, that they were going to inherit property, land in the new creation, actual physical space. That, and that physical space represented good life that would last into eternity. So when he asks, what must I do to inherit eternal life? That's the idea in his mind, that when God recreates everything on the last day in his judgment, what, what do I need to do to make sure that I get mine, that I've got my property, all my land? Which is fascinating because it's quite clear that that's what he already has right now on this side of heaven. In fact, um, we'll, we'll look at our first Greek word of today, and this will help um, convey this point. In verse 22, we have this word ketamata in Greek. It's what NIV translates as possessions, um, but probably a better translation is property or estate. Actually, yeah, the, sorry, the NIV translates it as wealth. Um, other translations um, translate it as possessions. So he, he's a man who already has, he's got land. He's got all the things that he needs to be well taken care of um, in that particular place and time. And Jesus is asking him, yeah, all those things that you... Uh, used to be secure, yeah, go sell, sell all that. Uh, let it go. So basically, he was happy with what he had, but he just wanted to ask Jesus. 
hey, how can I make sure I'm going to take this with me? Bingo! Yeah, bingo. They didn't have U-Haul bus back then. Yep, no. yep. U-Haul camel. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. Uh, and so that's the irony, right? One, thing's, one thing he lacks, but he doesn't lack anything. And yet he does lack what is most essential, which is having a sort of, not sort of, a childlike faith in which he brings nothing. Because it's noteworthy, it's really important actually that we see this. What is the story right before this one? The children come to Jesus. What do they have? Nothing. They have nothing. They have no value. They don't own any land. And so Jesus is upending all of their ideas of what is really valuable. In fact, in the ancient world of this time, it was assumed that if you were wealthy, that you were blessed by God. So you actually, the assumption was, if you were wealthy, you were pious. You were a good person, that you followed God. Because if not, God wouldn't bless you with all those things. Um, so this really, when Jesus says it's hard for a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven, that blows people's minds. That is really strange for them to hear because they assume that people who are wealthy are already favored by God. And Jesus is saying, nope, that's not so much the case. In fact, maybe more the opposite. And the way that the man leaves conveys that, that he's sad and he goes away um, because he had great wealth. The sense is that really his God was not Yahweh, was not Jesus. His God was security, his possessions, his stuff. I think it's interesting that the word, you know, that it says Jesus left him. Yeah. I wondered if more, well, a more understandable word for me would be that Jesus felt compassion on him because he knew where his heart was and he knew he wasn't, he was going to go away sad, so he felt bad for the guy. Yeah. Uh, I think that's a really good reading. Let's, let's just look at that word. Um, so the full word uh, is agapeson, uh, but it is, the root of it is agape. And I'm confident that most of you, if not all of you, have heard that Greek word before. It is the word for love. So NIV translates that well. And, um, and, and it is right to see it as unconditional love. It's right to see it as compassion. It's right to see it as take pleasure in. Um, be, so there's this um, the sense in which Jesus actually really does appreciate um, his response. He appreciates his question. He appreciates who this man is in and of himself. And yet he still has a hard response for him. He, he truly, he balances perfectly this love and truth. I love him so much. Oh, what a good question. But here's the truth. You love money. You love stuff. You just want to take what you already have into the, the next life after judgment comes. When true life is about connection with God. And it often requires that we give up everything for it. Yeah. Great observation. Okay. So then he goes on to talk about how hard it is for the rich to enter the kingdom of heaven and emphasizes it by repeating it in verses 24 and 25 and uses this bizarre illustration. It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for someone who is rich to enter the kingdom of God. Um, so couple more words I want to go over that really make this fascinating. Camelon is the Greek word for camel. And many people, when they have read this, in fact, it's funny, not only have people, when they've read this and 
tried to interpret and comment on it, been like, I don't have any idea why Jesus would say camel. Uh, many people, um, not long after Mark, it seems, actually changed this word in the manuscripts to this word, which looks very similar, but it means a very different thing. So it seems like, um, based on the manuscripts that we have, that people, <laughs> people thought that maybe Mark miswrote it, or maybe someone who was doing the early um, copies uh, accidentally put an E there instead of an I, because in their minds, rope makes much more sense than a camel, okay? Uh, rope is a big thread. And, and so it's related to a needle. It's within the context. And even though you can't really get rope through the eye of a needle, uh, it still makes more sense within the context of sewing and that sort of thing. Camel just seems totally out there. Like, what? A camel and a needle? That doesn't make any sense at all. Uh, so people have had some very uh, fascinating debates about what's happening here. Another one that you may have heard, I remember hearing it when I was a teenager, actually, is this idea that um, in Jerusalem that there was a gate called the Eye of the Needle. How many of you have heard this before? Uh, so the idea was there was a gate called the Eye of the Needle and that it was short, so much so that camels had to get down on their knees to be able to go through the gate. Um, that idea, I have no idea where it came from, and it's totally baseless. <laughs> there's, there's no eye of the needle gate, um, as far as we can tell, in any of our resources from the ancient first century. And the other trouble with that, um, that illustration was it actually um, undermines the whole point of the story, because the idea was that the camels could get through the eye of the needle if they got down on their knees. So it was, it was kind of difficult, but they could do it. And the point of the story is to say, it's impossible with humans. But with God, all things are possible. Uh, so it seems as though whether or not Jesus said camel on or camel on, the point is that it's impossible for a rich person to enter the kingdom of heaven except by God's power at work to transform their lives. Because, as many of us know, anyone who's followed Jesus for any length of time should know that there are people of wealth who are part of God's kingdom. There are people who have faith in God and have been blessed with financial security, so much so that typically they are very generous with it and they uh, uh, want to um, bless other people by it. So the point being that, that through God's transformative work in people's lives, that's how rich people enter the kingdom of heaven, not through their self-sufficiency. That's the point. It's not through the fact that they already have a bunch of stuff Typically, by the way, they didn't earn that. In the ancient world, you received it via inheritance. So that's another play on why inheritance is, is playing out here. Um, everything's pretty aristocratic. And so they would, um, rich people were rich because their daddy was rich and their daddy was rich and their daddy was rich before that, right? And not so much like today where in America, someone can rise from the bottom and make it to the top. Um, so, so in their worldview, inheritance into eternal life is about God's work, not about inheriting it from your daddy or your daddy or your daddy. Does that make sense? Yeah. Jesus, it's interesting that he calls them the disciples children. Children, yeah. I think that's incredibly intentionally based on the passage we had right before that where he is conveying to them that children should be welcomed. Guess what? You're the, the children too, because I've called you and you're following me. So understand this, that 
rich people are going to have a hard time entering the kingdom of God because of the dangers of um, being tempted to turn that into their God rather than me. Yeah, yeah, very good observation. Very good observation. Yep. Um, and then at the end of this section, Peter speaks up. Oh, Peter. <laughs> We've left everything to follow you, Jesus. Um, and he's right. Uh, despite the fact that Peter actually probably owns a home because uh, he is of age. Uh, in fact, a lot of people think that the home they keep going to in Capernaum uh, was probably Peter's. Uh, in fact, we know from other Gospels that he's married. Um, so he's, he's kind of left everything. Um, he's certainly, because he's traveling around with Jesus, he's not physically in his home and with his wife all the time. So uh, take that with a grain of salt. Uh, but Ju Jesus, I think, uh, in this particular passage in Mark, acknowledges that and says, Yes, truly I tell you, no one who has left home or brothers or sisters or mother or father or children or fields for me and the gospel will fail to receive a hundred times as much in this present age. Uh, fascinating. Uh, he has two lists here. Um, take a moment to look at the two lists of things that people leave to follow Jesus. Um, almost all of them are identical, but two things are different. What's different between the two lists? Can anyone see them? Father is in the first one. Father's in the first one and not in the second one. Good. And then what's in the second list that's not in the first list? The brothers. No, brothers are in both. <coughs> Persecution. Yes. What a great reward. Which, that's, what Jesus, that's what Jesus is doing. He's saying, these are all the things you leave, and now here's your reward. You're going to get brothers, sisters, mother, not father. We'll talk about why that's the case in a second. Fields and persecution. That's your reward for following me. <laughs> and eternal life. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. That which that is fascinating that he didn't mention that in this particular pericope. Yeah. Maybe. Well, and, and remember Jesus's other teaching, and uh, I can't remember if Mark talks about this later. Other gospels talk talk about it. The, the question about whether there's marriage after the resurrection, um, and Jesus says there isn't. So the sense in which um, that, that in the resurrection uh, that we are all united together with God. Um, so that could be, yeah, playing out there. Good observation. Good observation. It's yeah. interesting that you say that when you think about the religions out there that believe that families are united forever. Yeah. Yeah. Particularly our, how do we want to call them? Our LDS friends. Um, and how much weight they put in. So like yeah, it's everything. It's, yeah, I mean, yeah. For her to have us kids follow her, yeah. it's breaking her heart that we're not LDS too because mm -hmm. she feels she won't ever see us again. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, from my observations, the, I mean, the, the big values within the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints are family and really a works-based righteousness uh, that you have to I mean I don't I you guys would know better than me but because I don't think they'd outright say it but the way that life is lived out and portrayed is you have to work at it to be favored by God and the community at large um, and certainly a, a value of missions um, which I actually think we can learn something from what they do in, in missions. But those are kind of the three big values. And, and yeah, two of them are pretty antithetical to the gospel of Jesus. Not that family's bad. It's not. It's that for Jesus, family expands. It's not just about your blood relations. It's about those who follow my commands. This is what Jesus said. 
those who follow my commands, those are my brother, my sister, my mother. We, found, we had that earlier in Mark. Um, and so that's part of what Jesus is portraying here again. You left your mom, you left your brothers, you left everything to follow me. Guess what? In God's kingdom, you get them back. And you get them back in wonderful, beautiful ways in this grand family that we have together called the church right now and the kingdom of heaven after we die and after God renews all things. But it's noteworthy that the two differences. Why wouldn't Father be in the second list? You don't need a father. Bingo. Good job. You guys are getting this. You don't need me anymore. When <laughs> God's kingdom, the, the kingdom of heaven is infinite. There's, there's no limits on space. It's everyone, everybody. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And, they're, and we're all family. Yeah. And that's why he can say there's a hundred times. And, that, and that's probably an understatement, which is funny as much as Jesus exaggerates. Uh, so, yeah, it, it goes on and on and on. Uh, so, yes, Jessica is 100% right. He, there's no father mentioned because when you leave everything to follow Jesus, you are connected to the father automatically. The second part is probably the harder part for us to embrace, the persecutions. The sense is that in our following of Jesus, that persecutions are imminent. That's, that's definitely Mark's view, that if you're going to follow Jesus, it means deny yourself and take up your cross. We've already read that. Um, that means some sort of suffering along the way. And for us, in, in the current age in which we live, we typically see suffering as a bad thing, but that's not how Mark sees it. Suffering is a way we identify with Jesus. In other words, it's a way that we know that we are connected to Jesus because Jesus suffers and our, our desire is to follow him in every single way we can. So if we're suffering on account of Christ, that's how we know we're doing it right, just like Jesus did. That's, that's, I think, a still hard teaching for us uh, and a hard thing for us to wrap our minds around. And trust me, I don't like suffering. <laughs> it's not my favorite thing. Uh, but Mark is trying to, uh, particularly to people who are probably reading this while they're suffering for their faith, um, that would be encouraging to them to hear, oh, if I'm being persecuted, that means I'm doing it right especially in an ancient world that says probably more so than now that any sort of suffering is a bad thing, especially persecution, right? That would have been shameful. Um, and in an honor and shame culture, that's, that's really, really bad. Um, so for Mark to say, no, like if you're going through persecutions on account of Christ, you've got it right. You're going the right direction. You're going in the way of Jesus. You're, you're, already experiencing the first fruits of all of the kingdom glory that is to come, and it's going to get better. There will be eternal life. And that's how Jesus, thankfully, that's how he ends that section, uh, along with persecution, and then in the age to come, eternal life. But if you give up everything, isn't that a form of persecution? persecution? Mm, I would call it sacrifice. Persecution is typically defined as external factors or peoples who are invoking harm and suffering upon you. Giving up things on your own volition is sacrifice. And typically those two things are seen as different. Um, but certainly there's still suffering that results uh, of, because of both. Yeah. That's probably the way I was looking at it. Yep. Yep. You know, there's Good. something to point out. <clears throat> so the whole idea of persecution, maybe us living in the country that we do, where we have more religious freedoms, this seems more extreme to us. I think people who live in other countries where they're persecuted all the time, they actually kind of hold dear to that because it gives purpose to why they're being punished. Yep. It's almost a concept we can't comprehend the 
Correct. I, I think we do have a hard time comprehending that because of our cultural state in which we live right now. And, and um, don't hear me incorrectly, I think it's wonderful that we live in a country like this where we do have religious freedom. But I think you can make the argument, certainly historically, that the people that are most passionate about following Jesus historically, the people for whom the mission of Jesus is most clear and revivals break out, those are people who are typically under persecution. Um, and so it's no wonder why you look around the Christian landscape in America and the Western world today and you're like, yeah. everything looks kind of meh. Yeah. Nobody cares all that much. Well, and it's probably because there's no um, adversity. There's nothing pushing against us. Yeah. So, yeah. Please don't hear me say, yeah, we should all be martyrs. That's not what I'm saying. I don't want to convey a martyrdom complex. but appreciative and cognizant. We should have the same, yes, and the same sort of passion for Jesus that peoples who are suffering for it automatically understand. I want to be careful about that because, right, right. Well, again, thinking about it in our own context, I'm not really persecuted. Does that mean I'm not following Jesus to the best of my abilities? Well, maybe, but I hope not. <laughs> and I hope not for all our sakes, frankly. I don't want us to go through persecution. Um, so, so, yeah, I want to be really careful about that statement. What I definitely want to affirm is, is what the Bible affirms. If you're suffering on, because of the cause of Christ, you are not suffering in vain. You are suffering for a good purpose, and that is part of the good news. And even, according to Jesus here, even part of the reward, because you are identifying with Jesus in a way that other people who aren't suffering can't. Yeah. That's, that's a good question and a good thing to wrestle with. So you keep saying suffering, so if, uh, my mind is kind of going a little different way. So you're saying, you know, persecution, suffering. So people suffer, suffer for other reasons, not just <coughs> persecution. So how much of that kind of falls in with that? Say like medical suffering. So you're suffering more now I'm not quite sure where I'm going with that. <laughs> it sounds like you're trying to define or, or or look for a description of what I mean by suffering in this context. Is that is yeah, that right? Yeah. You know, I mean, people yeah. have extreme uh -huh. They're suffering now. Yeah. That form of persecution. I wouldn't say that's a form of persecution, but I would say that a lot of folks, and this is just really based on my own personal experience, a lot of folks who go through extreme suffering because of health issues, they do have a greater sense of God's grace, His healing power, His sovereignty, the sense in which, you know, even if I die, that's okay. I get to be with Jesus now. Yeah. 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 So I don't think it's quite the same as persecution, but certainly I would say God is so compassionate and present and caring for those who are suffering for any reason that for those in those circumstances, they are um, closer. Yeah. 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 Really good question. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Great. So persecution is more like some of these other countries where you have these groups of Christians where they're literally hiding in houses trying to hold their meetings and praying to God they don't get caught because if they do they could be thrown in jail. Correct. Tormented, whatever. So it's an it's an extreme that we here in the United States don't really even comprehend for the 
most part, it's like not a value that we can even relate to. Relate to. Yeah. Because it doesn't or hasn't happened to us yet. Yeah. Let maybe this will help clear things up. Historically, the, uh, the Christian view of persecution is suffering on account of Christ by the hands of the powerful, particularly governments, um, typically, not always, but most of the time. It's those who are in charge, who jail, torment, um, death threats, and then, of course, even death um, that they enact upon the people of God in Christ. Yeah. Um, so that that's a somewhat narrow definition, but, but that is the more historical Christian definition of persecution. Yeah. Okay. Good questions. Good, good conversation here. Let's, let's uh, mosey on uh, to 32. I'm going to, I'm actually going to read 32 through 45. They were on their way up to Jerusalem with Jesus leading the way, and the disciples were astonished, while those who followed were afraid. Again, he took the twelve aside and told them what was going to happen to him. We are going up to Jerusalem, he said, and the Son of Man will be delivered over to the chief priests and the teachers of the law. They will condemn him to death and will hand him over to the Gentiles, who will mock him and spit on him, flog him, and kill him. And three days later, he will rise. Then James and John, the sons of Zebedee, came to him. Uh, Teacher, they said, um, we want you to do for us whatever we ask. What do you want me to do for you, he asked. They replied, "Um, let one of us sit at your right and the other at your left in your glory. You don't know what you are asking, Jesus said. Can you drink the cup I drink or be baptized with the baptism I am baptized with? We can, they answered. Jesus said to them, you will drink the cup I drink and be baptized with the baptism I am baptized with. But to sit at my right or left is not for me to grant. These places belong to those for whom they have been prepared. When the ten heard about this, they became indignant with James and John. I wonder why. Uh, Jesus called them together and said, You know that those who, regarded, who are regarded as rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and their high officials exercise authority over them. Not so with you. Instead, whoever wants to become great among you must be your servant, and whoever wants to be first must be slave of all. For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. So this is the third prediction of Jesus' death, and uh, this one um, definitely more graphic than the others. He describes the ways that the Gentiles treat him as they mock him and spit on him, flog him, and kill him in verse 34. Um, And then immediately after, the most egregious example of misunderstanding by the disciples. And and I hope you are catching this repeated theme of not only the disciples not getting it, but in particular, they're not getting the power aspect of this. They they keep thinking that there's going to be something in it for them, some power as we revolution against the Romans. And... And Jesus keeps coming back to first will be last, last will be first. You must be a servant. Son of man came to serve. Um, So uh, in their gall, they ask Jesus. um, In fact, not, not ask. They tell Jesus, make us first and second in your kingdom, essentially is what they're saying. Put us at your right and your left as positions of power when they come into glory. And and Jesus says, you know, you don't really know what you are asking. So in verse 38, 
he uh, says, can you drink the cup that I drink? That's a reference to an Old Testament allusion that actually comes up in a few different places. Um, and actually, the allusion can go one of two ways. In multiple places in the Old Testament, the cup is referred to as a cup of blessing, a sense in which um, it's a metaphor, a symbol of ways in which God blesses people, particularly those who are living righteous lives. At the same time, the cup can also be used as a way to talk about God's righteous judgment, and that's the context in which Jesus is referring to right now. So there are Old Testament passages like Psalm 75, verse 8, Jeremiah chapter 25, verses 15 through 29, Lamentations verse four, or chapter 4, verse 21, and then Ezekiel chapter 23, verse 32, that all talk about the cup of God's righteous judgment or, or wrath. Um, that's the cup that Jesus is referring to here. And then, along with that image of the cup, he has the image of baptism, which, as we've talked about before, is a sign of death. You go into the waters and die to one particular way of life and rise up in new life. But in the context of this particular passage, the death image is the preeminent one, the prominent one that's sticking out. So Jesus is saying, yeah, can you embrace God's justice, his righteous judgment that is about to be enacted upon me through death? Can you really embrace that? They, of course, don't get it and say, yeah, we can. <laughs> and then Jesus says, well, you will, actually. Uh, so he is prophetically uh, talking about their their own journey to the cross, and not literally. Uh, for James and John, um, one of them is beheaded by a sword. They, uh, I think the other one they, they're not completely sure about. I think stabbed to death. Um, either way, they die for the cause of Christ eventually. But it's not just about the death. It's also about once Jesus resurrects and then the giving of the Spirit, James and John do figure it out, as do the, most of the disciples, and they live what's called the cruciform life. The cruciform life is a theological idea that is about how, as followers of Jesus, we are to live as people of service and sacrifice. In other words, we may not actually be going to the cross, that's cruciform, but our lives by the ways we serve and care for and even sacrifice for one another are a picture of the way that Christ sacrificed for us. And James and John live that out up until their actual death. So Jesus is uh, prophesying for this occurrence to happen later um, for the two of them in particular. But then says, it's not for me to grant who gets to sit at my right and left. And though Mark doesn't outright tell us, I think the safe assumption is that's the Father's ability to pick. So then the other disciples find out about this interaction. Seems in that they're like within earshot. So they're not very happy about this interaction. Jesus sees this and says that, you know, like the rulers of the Gentiles, they lord it over their people. He uses this word in Greek. Katakairio. So, um, yeah, NIV translates it as lord over, but it can also be translated as overpower. Um, and, and it's a, a sense of coercive power. In other words, I'm in charge, and you're going to do what I say you're going to do. And that's the way it is. 
So Jesus is referring to the ways that the Gentile rulers, they, they, they lord it over their people. And he's saying, if you get into arguments like this, that's what's going to happen to you. That's not how you are supposed to be. Instead, whoever wants to be great among you must be your servant. So we've been talking about um, cultural um, expectations and mores as, as what's happening in the background tonight. As radical as any statement as we've seen so far, serving others is so countercultural. The great values of particularly the Roman world in this day are ambition, power. Servitude is not good. It is a vice in that day and age. And so uh, Jesus, once again, very, very countercultural, very, um, uh, yeah, running against the grain in saying that you, if you want to be great, you must be a servant to all. And then verse 45, I want to highlight one word in particular because it carries a lot of weight. But we don't always do a good job of understanding what it means in the context in which it is written. So the word litron is ransom. And when we think about ransom, we typically think about it in terms of what theologians have worked out over the course of 2,000 years, and we think about it in terms of atonement theories. In other words, the ways in which Jesus' sacrificial death bring to us life and the ability to be connected with God. So when we think of ransom, that's typically what we think of. But within the ancient Jewish context in which this is written, ransoms are things you pay to free slaves. So when Jesus says in verse 45, For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many, Literally within the context, he's saying, I'm giving my life so that all of you who are enslaved by the context is coercive powers, you can be freed by them. Now, we should then take the nice theological step of saying it's not just about coercive powers, it's about anything that entangles us from living the life God wants for us. And so we rightly then say things like sin right, are things that bind us and hold us together. But, but I, I think we often take that step too quickly. We don't read within the passage itself from which this idea of ransom comes. By the way, ransom doesn't show up a whole lot in the New Testament. It does happen here and there, but it's actually not a huge image of what Christ's sacrificial death means. It is a, an, an image, but not the only one. But the sense is certainly that in his giving of his life as a ransom, it's for freedom. And in the context of this passage, it's freedoms from the coercive powers that bind us and um, essentially, yeah, put us in, in a sort of jail, if not outright jail. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, I skipped over that part. Yeah. What's that about? Wow, yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, good question. Yeah. What is that about? Why are the disciples astonished and the others who are following with them afraid? A uh, couple different theories here, and I actually put that paper down here already. Um. So one, one theory is that it's because of how resolute Jesus is for the journey. 
Uh, just he's been kind of wandering around right so far in Mark. He's in this part of Galilee, and now we're going over here, and now we're going to go to the Gal uh, Gentile place, and now we're going to come back. And now all of a sudden, he is like, we're going to Jerusalem. Um, so a sense of like, all right, we're finally. Uh, and again, think in their minds. They're thinking revolution. Where do you go to have a revolution? You got to go to the seat of power, which is Jerusalem. Okay, so the disciples, I think, are astonished because we've been wandering around so much, and now all of a sudden Jesus wants to go to Jerusalem? Okay. The rest of the people, they also have this in mind, and they're like, oh, are we, are we going to, you know, do the whole revolution right now with the swords and the killing and all of that stuff? That's very scary. Thus, they're afraid. So, so that's one theory, that because of how resolute he is, um, and they are anticipating this showdown in Jerusalem, uh, that um, that's why there's astonishment and uh, fear. Uh, another theory is that they're just in awe and wonder of Jesus in this present moment, particularly having come off of this teaching about um, who can enter the kingdom and he essentially says it's hard for rich people to and they're like you got to be kidding like these i mean uh, rich people always get to into wherever they want to go like um so that could be the astonishment part uh, or or the fear part could be that um that I, because this is so countercultural that the, the people are just like, I, what do we hold on to? What is, um, what are we supposed to value? Um, of course, ignoring all the things that Jesus says we should value uh, along the way. So, so some theories, but, but Mark just doesn't outright tell us um, why they are astonished and afraid. Re really good question. Sorry that I, I missed that earlier. Um, but yeah, and I, I tend to lean toward they, they see where Jesus is going. He's headed to Jerusalem, and they think there's some sort of showdown coming, and that's why they're astonished or afraid. But how do they, how do they get that in their mind when he's telling them that he's going to die? And yeah, yeah, exactly. Jesus, that's the point. They don't get it. They're so silly. Oh my goodness. Yeah. It's because it's so ingrained in their mind. That it's so ingrained that if we are going to bring Israel back into power, this is how you do it. Because that's how it's been tried many, 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 many times already. And worked actually once. If so, um, in the Maccabean revolt that happens a few hundred years before Jesus, they really did go into Jerusalem and fight off the invaders and they took it over again. And so they're thinking, we can do it again. It's been happening. It's, it's happened before. Um, <laughs> that being said, uh, they keep trying it and it keeps failing. Uh, there have been lots of people by this point who have claimed to be Messiah figures who have rallied a bunch of people together and, let's go get them, and the Romans are like, whap. <laughs> they, they put it down pretty quickly. Uh, in fact, the Romans were historically really good at fighting off insurrections. Um, so there's just this really ingrained cultural understanding that we're going to get our nation back. And if the only way to do it is to fight and to, to um, yeah, take up arms against the Romans. And uh, so I think that's why they, they just have such a hard time with Jesus saying, no, it's not, it's not fight. It's actually serve. It's actually sacrifice. It's forgive. Um, it's be a part of this new kingdom. That's why he uses the phrase kingdom of God. That's not a phrase that the other messiahs would have used. They would have said kingdom of Israel. Um, Jesus uses kingdom of God to talk about a whole new way of doing life together. And then as we see in Mark, that extends beyond just Jewish people to Gentiles as well, which again, very countercultural. So I, I guess
get the feeling that Jesus is very graphic in explaining what's about to happen in Jerusalem to take away some of their excitement. And it's, it's like he's setting them up. He's like, this is what's going to happen. Yeah. What you're expecting and what's going to happen. And, that's, and that's what we should expect to see. And then we see James and John go, power please. <laughs> yeah, yeah, right. And so Mark writes it, again, Mark, beautiful writing here. He writes it in a way that you're like, yeah, they should be kind of afraid of what's to come. Makes sense. Their, their leader, their friend is going to die. Um, and, and because they're closely tied, that might mean bad news for them too. And that's not what they're thinking. They're thinking, oh boy, we're almost there. Maybe I get to sit on his right and you could sit on his left and... Who knows what's happening to Peter at this point? Everyone knows he's been the leader, but blah, whatever. Uh, you know. Yeah. Yeah, those are the... We should be seeing like, oh, you guys, guys, come on. You don't, you don't get it. Uh, that's what Mark wants us to see. Yeah, really, really good. Okay, I want to at least get through one more section before we wrap up. 46 through 52. Of chapter 10. Then they came to Jericho as Jesus and his disciples, together with a large crowd, were leaving the city. A blind man, Bartimaeus, which means son of Timaeus, was sitting by the roadside begging. When he heard that it was Jesus of Nazareth, he began to shout, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Many rebuked him and told him to be quiet. But he shouted all the more, Son of David, have mercy on me. Jesus stopped and said, Call him. So they called to the blind man, Cheer up, on your feet, he's calling you. Throwing his cloak aside, he jumped to his feet and came to Jesus. What do you want me to do for you? Jesus asked him. The blind man said, Rabbi, I want to see Go, said Jesus, your faith has healed you. Immediately he received his sight and followed Jesus along the road. I mentioned, I think last week, that this section that we are just concluding uh, is bookmarked on both ends by these blind men healing stories. Bartimaeus on this side and, and the other man who has to be uh, touch twice to receive his sight. Um, and so in between are these repeated stories that are, are revealing Jesus's identity. Uh, the death predictions are happening there. The transfiguration happens there. And so this um, ends essentially a section of Mark's gospel. He's now going to move into what will be really the, the slowest section. Remember, I've talked about how Mark's always like, immediately Jesus does this, and then immediately Jesus does that. And he's like, oh, we're always going really fast to the next thing. Um, Mark is going to slow it way down. I mean, almost to a grinding halt. Um, he's essentially just like this, like this, like this, over the course of probably a year or so. And now we're going to get to chapter 11, and the rest of Mark is about one week worth of time. Um, so he, he really <clears throat> halts things. Um, so it's significant, this transitionary story. Um, so first, son of Timaeus. Mark, thank you for uh, defining what Bartimaeus means. Uh, but what does Timaeus actually mean? Because as you've probably seen, names always mean something in the ancient world. Um, and in this case, that's definitely true. Uh, Timaeus means honor. So Bartimaeus is a son of honor. So there's this is one more area uh, that we didn't... Uh, highlight earlier in the behind the text, but I should have. In the context of the ancient Jewish world, and this is still the case in many Eastern cultures, the highest value in the culture is honor. To be honored 
is to be at the height of um, communal living. Um, it is the, the most significant thing. Um, so you'll, we'll kind of catch glimpses of it when we read or watch shows that are rooted in some Eastern cultures. Um, like this is still very much the case in Japanese, Korean, Far Eastern cultures. The, the, they care very, very deeply about honor. Um, so what that means inversely is that the worst thing is shame. Shame is the thing that inhibits honor, it inhibits relationship, it's what kicks you out of community, or when you're kicked out of community, then you receive shame. It can be cyclical in that way. Um, so when we see the name Son of Honor, we should automatically think, oh, this is a honor and shame story. So how is that playing out? Let's look at the rest of the text. So son of Timaeus, the son of honor, uh, he is sitting by the roadside begging. That should startle us. The son of honor is doing something very shameful in the ancient world, begging, as is still the case today, actually, even in Western culture, right? We don't tend to think of begging as a, yeah, let's all go beg. That's a really honorable thing to do. Now, it's, it's pretty shameful. Um, so we've already got a juxtaposition here in, in verse 46. So he hears about Jesus of Nazareth, and he begins to shout, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Mark has not called Jesus a son of David yet. This is the first time this happens. It's, so it's noteworthy. Why? David is king, right? In fact, for the Israelites, he is the, the archetype of a king. In other words, the premier example of what a king should look like is David. And so for Jesus to be referred to as a son of David means that Jesus is being referred to in that sort of line of, oh, he's a, a good king. Um, so fascinating that, that this blind man who hasn't ever interacted with Jesus to this point somehow has this clear vision already of who Jesus really is, uh, that, that he is this divine king figure on his way to Jerusalem. He's just going to enact his kingdom in a very different way than kings have before. And so he states, or he asks this question, which was a very common question uh, for people to ask in the audience of a king. O king, have mercy on me. In other words, if, if someone came into a king's audience and they needed something from the king, they would usually start by, have mercy on me. The king would ask, what can I do for you? Then they would state their request. Um, so uh, Timaeus, the son of honor, in a shameful state, crazy juxtaposition, but he also has this clear sense of Jesus as king. Now, uh, all the people are like, shut up, you shameful, shameful beggar. Stop talking. But he shouts all the more. By the way, that's more shame. Uh, if you're told to be quiet, then you should be quiet. Uh, but he shouts all the more, son of David, have mercy on me. Jesus stops and says, call him. Very intentional language by Mark. Not, yeah, have him come over. Call him. That's language he uses to talk about people who become his close followers. They get called to him. So, so multiple ways that uh, these, these ideas of honor and shame are being thrown around right now. This is a very honorable thing for Jesus to call him into his presence despite the fact that he's a beggar who's yelling like a wild, crazy man, which would have been very shameful. So they call the blind man. <laughs> their, their tone changes real quick. Cheer up! <laughs> On your feet! He's calling you. Throwing his cloak aside. For a blind beggar, the cloak is everything. This is his security blanket, literally. This is everything. He knows something transformative is going to happen. He throws the cloak aside. He doesn't need the cloak anymore. 
he already knows. He jumps to his feet. He comes to Jesus. Jesus asks, what do you want me to do for you? By the way, that's the exact same question that Jesus asks James and John in the preceding story. Exact same question. Good stuff for Mark. And the blind, blind man says, not, he doesn't say, I want to be at your right or your left, Jesus. I want to see. And we talked about, I can't remember if it was last week or two weeks ago, see doesn't just mean literally see, although it does mean that, but it also means to see spiritually, to know what's really going on. I want to see. Um, in fact, uh, the word there uh, is anablepso. Um, we defined that word, and ana actually means again. Um, so th- this blind man, assumably, well, hasn't always been blind. So he wants to see again. He wants to see more thoroughly. And so Jesus responds by saying, go, your faith has sozo. We define that word as well. It's the word that can be translated either as healing or saved. Go, your faith has saved you or healed you. And immediately he receives his sight and follows Jesus along the road. A lot of the other healing stories, those people stay with their family or they, or Jesus even commands them not to come with them. Not the case here. Why? Because Jesus has called him to follow. So in this story, we've got this very shameful man, because he's blind, because he's a beggar, he's <laughs> yelling like a crazy person. All these things that exhibit shame, which would have been the worst thing he could have done and the worst possible thing to make him the furthest outcast, Jesus embraces him and truly makes him a son of honor. Other things, so you get all to the other blind people that he... Yeah, in this case, he doesn't need to. Four or five of them. Yeah. Uh, and it seems to be that, that that's because uh, his faith is so strong already. He, the sense is his faith is already, like you already see. He sees the spiritual already. He knows he's son of David. He knows he's king. He knows this is the most powerful being who has ever lived because he has always lived, he is God in human form, um, he trusts that he doesn't need to be touched because Jesus could just snap his fingers or just say the word, and he's healed, and that's exactly what happens. It seems to me that the blind man was maybe partially blind because he ran to Jesus. How do you run to Jesus if you're blind and you can't see at all? <laughs> I don't know. It it could be. Yeah, that very well could be. He could be partially blind. It could be. Mark doesn't tell us. Yeah, good observation. If his dad was honorable, why was he sitting beside the road? Shouldn't he be with his father? Because the shameful, and so he couldn't stay with his family. That would have brought shame on the whole family. Well, that's still the case in honor and shame cultures. But yeah, it is horrible. (laughs) And that's why Jesus is responding with, it doesn't have to be this way. You can be a son of honor again. And he makes that the case. Why do they put all the genealogies of Jesus in there and put him to to David when he was actually... It goes down through Joseph. Uh, Joseph had nothing to do with it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, how can they actually say, hey, he's the son of David? If he's never. Yeah. Never mind. Hey, nope, <laughs> nope. It's a, it is a good question, so I'll respond. Um, so, obviously, with Mark, Mark doesn't do any genealogies, so you're referring to Matthew. Yeah, the next yeah, 
Yeah, so Matthew and Luke, they do genealogies, and what they're trying to do is connect Jesus to the Hebrew Scriptures and the story of God. And so when they refer to David, um, what they're saying is not literally that he is a child or a great, 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 so on and so on, grandson of David, but that he is in the line of David in the theological sense, in that he is enacting what David was attempting to do as he followed God as king. Does that make sense? And the same with Joseph, right? So Joseph get Joseph literally would have been in the line of David, even though Joseph did have nothing to do with Jesus other than um, the angels coming to him and him trusting that he was still supposed to marry Mary. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you for catching that. Um, and so, yes, I mean, there's not... <laughs> Uh, Joseph had no biological connection to Jesus, but the point is that he is in the line, theologically, the, the sense of a line of faith um, that has a familial connection to it. And Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, Jesus that as well. Was born in the city of David. Correct, Bethlehem. So that's part of the... Yeah, so that, yeah, yeah, that's a way that, that, that yeah, that we're that, reconnecting. That was where all the people came. Yeah, for the census. So, yeah. Yep. Is this, this story here with this blind man where he's sitting on the side of the road kind of lend credence to Jesus as whoever is the least of you? Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, that's all these, just that's... showing the, the apostles. Yeah. Look, I just took this blind guy sitting on, and now, look at him, he's now... Here. Yeah, we can call it an active parable, right? So, so parables are typically these stories that we would say, or that didn't really happen, but it's a, it teaches some sort of point. Um, active parables are things that the, the way that Mark writes it, or this did happen, and it's teaching and in this case, reinforcing the point that he's making over and over and over and over and over and over again. Uh, yes? I see the blind man as one of the children that they, he rebuked them for not allowing him to come. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yes. We should make the connection between the blind man there, the children, the, those who are caused to stumble, in chapter 9, which also could be children, uh, the, the boy who's possessed by an impure spirit, um, and then that first blind man at Bethsaida. All of those folks are in the same category as far as Mark is concerned. Yep, really good. Very good. All right. Uh, so we didn't quite get to the so what, so you know what that means. Homework time. So what? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, I, I want to get a little bit more specific, actually, with the, the homework this time. I, here's what I want you to reflect on. One paragraph is plenty. What does it mean for us people living in Twin Falls, Idaho, United States of America, 21st century. What does it mean for us to be people who, who value serving, sacrifice? In the words of Jesus, who put the first last and the last first, who come to serve, but not to be served. Because that's, that's very clearly the preeminent theme of what we covered tonight is about serving, sacrifice, um, letting go of power. What does that actually look like for you and me today in the world in which we live? That's a long way of asking, uh, what does it mean to serve in the line of Jesus? That's the, that's the short question. Have I confused you all? <laughs> I think yeah. everything to write it down to keep 
can you email it? Sure. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. When I uh, send out the video, um, I'll include the homework question as well. Yeah. So as always, it's not required, but I always love reading what you write. It really helps me to know how well the, the things that I'm teaching are being communicated if we're understanding what's happening and then being able to apply it. So, and I think it's always good practice for us to reflect on, okay, just because we learned a bunch of interesting things, what does that mean now? What does this mean for us today? So, yeah. All right, thanks everyone. Thank you. Have a great night.